a pretty cabin't. I was in the urn with a jug on my head. I said, sorry, sorry, big pardon. <laughs> no, no, I'll say it again. I was in a jug, the jug with the urn on my head. It was a dirty, dank, ding, ch oh, God help us. <laughs> oh, my da, ha, ha, you try. Here we are, where's she? You try, said it. Dirty, dank, dim dungeon. I started working with Frank in the 60s, and over the years, he became a very close friend. Many's the time he'd ring me up and say, what are you and Tim doing tonight, girl? And if I said we were both free, he'd say, right, I'll be over for dinner around eight, all right? I fell for it every time, but he was actually a very generous man as a person and as a performer. Have you, have you noticed it's all trends these days, new ideas cropping up? You take my hairdressers. I used to stroll in, flop into a chair, have a chat with Albert about the weather, get a tip for the 3.30. <laughs> At least it's how it used to be till the other morning. Good morning. So nice to see you. I'm ready for you. Pardon? <laughs> I'm the new assistant, Stella, chair three. Are you? I'm Francis. Carefree. <laughs> tune brings back many fond memories. The trials and tribulations of a happily married couple which the viewing public took to their hearts for 13 years. And if you think I'm talking about Richard and Judy, go to the back of the class. I'm talking about me and screen husband Terry Scott. Dear Terry, we first worked together in a series called Scott On. Each programme had a theme and from Scott On Wealth, Terry and I played a couple not unlike the pair we were to play on a regular basis two and a half years later, when I was to become a martyr to the rubber gloves. Five pounds, this lot cost me five pounds. I'm not denying it, love. No, but you keep asking me where all the money goes, and I'm telling yeah, but you. All I'm saying is we've got to economise. Well, then tell me how to economise. Yeah. Go well, on. Well, keep calm, keep calm. Now, sit down, calm me and sit to me for five minutes with a paper and pencil, and we'll work out where all the money goes. Now, what, what, are, you, what are you looking for? I'm looking for a pencil. Well, sit down. Now, keep calm, sit down. I'll get a pencil. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Why, why is it that we've never got any pencils in the house? I, mean, I, I bring pencils home. I had to go out and buy a pencil the other day and it cost five pence. That's an old shilling for a pencil. But I can bring pencils home from the office. I mean, that is where you waste money, you see, don't you? Well, because I buy things and you steal them. I don't. <laughs> I don't steal them and we're issued with them. Well, when I'm issued with groceries, I'll start economising. Yes, well, all, um, ah. Thank you. Right, now, now, let's, let's go through the grocers and see what you bought. Now, now pull them up. Butter, cheese, mm, eggs, cheese. sausages, mm. baked beans, mm. gravy browning. Eggs, sausages. Oh, we don't need that. What do we need that for? Need what for? Gravy browning. For browning the gravy. <laughs> <laughs> well, why do we have to have brown gravy? Why can't we have gravy? Coloured uh, gravy. <laughs> Free from artificial colouring. I mean, you, you don't know what's in that muck. It's only burnt sugar. Burnt sugar? Yes. Well, what do we have to buy burnt sugar for? I mean, surely you're capable of burning a bit of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> you burnt the old Sunday lunch last week. <laughs> That's that oven. I keep telling you we need a new oven. Never mind about that. From now on, we'll cut out gravy browning because we don't need it. But I bought a big bottle of oh, it. Chuck it away. <laughs> now, now what else have we got? Um, cooking fat, flour, bread and cakes. Now, uh, why can't you knock up a few homemade cakes? What? When do I get time? If you were to get up earlier, you could make... <laughs> <laughs> if you were to get up half an hour earlier... In that case, we not only need a new cooker, we need a new alarm clock as well. Why is it... When I, when I, when I think of a way of saving money, you can think of two ways of spending it. Why? All right, darling. I'll get up at six and I'll make some cakes. And you can get up and help me. Huh. Well, you can sift the flour and mix the ingredients yeah, well, and wash we'll, up. We'll talk about that in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, what else have we got? Uh, soap powder, mm. jam, mm. tin of peaches. They're for you. I don't like them. Mm. Well, I don't like jam, but I don't say you shouldn't buy it. Thank you. <laughs> Same. I can't see why you can't make it. Oh, what a good idea. We'll get up at five and make the jam and then make the <laughs> 
Our producer, Peter Whitmore, thought the domestic sketches might be worth developing, and it was Terry's idea to start the pilot episode of Happy Ever After with the final Fletcher offspring having just flown the nest. Five years after that first show, and several series later, we changed writers, and the Fletchers of Ealing became the Medfords of Purley. As no one on the production team could think of a suitable title for the new project, the BBC, in a sudden flash of inspiration, called it Terry and June. In our festive episode of 1985, Terry and I have been bulldozed by Terry's boss, Sir Dennis, into playing the cow for the firm's pantomime, Jack and the Beanstalk. Naturally, Terry insists that he and the good lady wife rehearse at home. I still think you might have asked me before saying yes. I know, but when I found out that Beatty was doing one of the broker's men, I thought, you know, you'd be... A perfect cow. <laughs> I thought you'd like to join in the fun. Fun? Well, if you don't do it, I'll have to do it with somebody else. It might be somebody I don't know. I mean... I mean, man and wife are supposed to be one flesh, so I thought we may as well share the same skin. Do you want to call for it? Call for what? Heads or tails. Oh, <laughs> no, Terry. If I'm going to be half a cow, I'm going to be the front half. Oh, June, June, seriously, you have absolutely no sense of direction. Nevertheless... Besides, I have a bad back, remember? In any case, with the back legs is much the more interesting part. Maybe, but the outlook's pretty grim. <laughs> I mean, you get to do all that really funny, funny milking business. <laughs> what milking business? Well, you know, a pint of silver top for Jack, a pint of gold top for the princess, and a pint of milk start for the dame. <laughs> That'd be really hilarious. <laughs> If Sir Dennis doesn't cut it. I mean, all the one in the front gets to do is to waggle the ears and make sure they don't bump into the bean store. I still don't want to be the back legs. Now, let me, let me show you the dance. Oh, there's a dance? Oh, yes, I worked it out at the office. It's not too complicated, is it? Ah, of course not. Oh, Miss Fennel mastered it and she dances like she's got two left shoes and her laces tied together. <laughs> <coughs> now, we do it to T for two, right? Okay. Right, right. Uh, close. Uh, Picture you upon my knee. Moo! T for two and two for T. Moo! You for me and me for you. Uh, moo! 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 You see? And then we, we repeat the steps then. First to the left, then to the right, and we start right from the beginning again. Have you got it? The name is June Medford, you know, not Ginger Rogers. <laughs> Look, get behind me, get behind me. Sometimes it's best to be thrown in at the deep end. Some ends are deeper than others. <laughs> Follow me and just wa watch my feet. Right? Well, that's not too difficult. <clears throat> right. We do it on, on the left, starting on the left. Okay. One, two, cha, cha, cha. Uh, one, one, two, two cha, cha, cha. Picture you upon my knee. Two, two, for two, and two, for tea. Me, me, for you, and you, for me. Ah, move, 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 move. Why didn't you turn? I did turn. At the same time I did? I did. Well, why do I end up looking at my own backside? <laughs> I don't know. I've had to look at it for long enough. My first panto was Cinderella, in which I played the title role opposite Wilfred Pickles' Buttons. Yeah, that's given you an idea of how long ago it was. 1946, to be precise. Even the pumpkin was on rationing. My next panto was with Frankie Howard 35 years later, so I must have made quite an impression in my first one. And it was another pantomime that led to my going into a long-running radio show that needs no introduction, except perhaps this. In 1983 at the Richmond Theatre, I was appearing as the good fairy in Dick Whittington with Roy Hudd. One night, Roy said to me, you know, we're in dead trouble, June. Alison Steadman is leaving the Hudlines and we've got no one to replace her. We've tried everyone. I said, well, you haven't tried me. I've done the odd bit of radio in my time. And Roy said, ah, oh, yes, yes, but we need someone who can do impressions. You know, you have to do Margaret Thatcher and so on. Well, in the panto, I had to referee a fight between Dick and the wicked Queen Rat, played by Honor Blackman. And at the next performance, when the scene came up, I said, 
Go to your corners, and when you hear the bell, you come out fighting. And Roy said, you got the job. Hello? Is that Windsor Pizza Realm? <laughs> yes, it is one again. Uh, the usual, please. Uh, what type of crust? Upper, naturally. <laughs> Yes, that's the one. Salty, thick, nothing on top. The Duke of Edinburgh special, thank you. <laughs> so there was this nun, you see, and she bumps into this rear admiral, and they were in this pub down by these docks, and... Oh, no. See, I could never be a stand-up performer. That's why I admire so much the wonderful people I've worked with. Roy Hudd, in his usual gentlemanly fashion, has referred to me as the comic's tart. Or sometimes as the comics labourer. It's certainly a labour of love as far as I'm concerned, working on the headlines. Yes? Are you Damien Lim? Who wants to know? I'm a police officer. The name's WPC Dandini. Oh, my stars. I swear on my uncle's vanity case. It wasn't me. <laughs> Who is it, Dame? Oh, it's a woman policeman. Oh? Have you been hanging around that building site again? <laughs> That's right. Go on, shut it out for the whole street here, Macy Megamouth. Show her in and shut the door. Are you Justin? No, no, I've been in for ages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, I see what you mean. That's right, love. Justin Puce. So, uh... <laughs> what can I do for you? They've come to live with you. Oh! oh. <laughs> no! Oh, quick! A what? bite of brandy and a charred feather. Just oh. <laughs> Where's my matches? How could you? You... Oh, you treacherous hussy. I know nothing about it, Damien. <laughs> nothing do I know about it. <laughs> I swear, love. I think you misunderstand me. Nice Didn't you get our got, directive? Mm. Lovely moustache. <laughs> and the keys on the <laughs> skirt. <laughs> Did you not get our directive from the station? Mm. To wit and viz, I'll read it to you. In order... <laughs> in order to obtain a better I'll relationship... Can, uh, go on, dear. Go on, she's bought you, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. In on. order to obtain a better relationship between the police and the minority groups, a newly trained Rosa shall cohabit in a non-compromising manner with those members of the public of a particular persuasion. Oh, he doesn't need any persuading, love. <laughs> a couple of cherry bees is anybody's. <laughs> Madam Kelment, bonjour. Hello? <laughs> Tell me, how does it feel to have attained this great age? Hello? <laughs> Hello? Madam? Good morning. You won't get any joy there, Mush. She's a bit French chef, you French know. French chef? Deaf. On account of all she's got her ear trumpet in back to front. <laughs> Permit me to introduce myself. I am a fellow resident, Monsieur Davignon. And at my time of life, none is all I'm having. <laughs> Davignon? Oh, like in the nursery rhyme, Surly Pons Davignon. Uh, that is my nickname, yes. <laughs> if I just adjust Madame's ear trumpet. <laughs> I must ask her a question. I wish you would, sir, yes. Madame, what is your secret for a long life? Not dying, of course. <laughs> that ends the snails. Snails? You eat them? No, I race against them. <laughs> for exercise. Oh, I see. Also, for all my 120 years, I smoke, I drink... I eat the fatty foods. Oh. I try giving up once. Uh, how did you feel? 160. <laughs> Are you suggesting that Miss Nightingale is a woman of low morals who carouses, gambles, flirts and drinks? Of course I am. Hello, boys. <laughs> it's me again, Florence. I come to make sure you're all right. Hello, Jim. Hello. You're having it off today. <laughs> The bandage, I mean, saucy. <laughs> oh, Bill. Yes. That's a nasty looking hand you got there. Mm. Yeah, better ask the dealer for another one. <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway, boys, bye for now. See you later. And remember, keep them stiff. Oh, right. you're up the lips, of course. <laughs> <laughs> don't blame me. I don't write the stuff, I just do it. And sometimes under protest, I might add. Still, as Roy would say, it's good, honest vulgarity. Here she is. Where was the concert this time, dear? Eel Pie Island again, was it? <laughs> Let's see, was it? Anyone we should have heard of? The Beatles, the Stones, the Rolling Who. <laughs> Dizzy, dear. Are you okay? Is that cider I can smell on your face? <laughs> that was my very first, if rather brief, appearance in Absolutely Fabulous. That came about as a result of my guesting on a French and Saunders show sometime earlier. I think Jennifer, the writer, saw me at the start as the sobering influence on her character's somewhat peculiar household. But as time went on, it became obvious that even Mother lived in a world of her own. <sighs> Safi. Morning, oh. dear. God, what are you doing here? Well, I'm coming to stay, dear, while you're away to keep Saffron company. No, you're not. Is she, sweetie? I don't mind. Well, Safi doesn't want you staying here, cramping her style. She wants a little bit of freedom. She wants to have parties and have boys around and play loud music. And have orgies. Yeah, a bit of snogging and <laughs> smash the place up a bit and crash out of the pool. In a pool of sick. Yes. <laughs> oh, don't. Well, why not, darling? Why not try it just once, sweetie? You're not like your mother in that respect, are you, Saffron? She spent most of her teenage years sitting on a large bean bag, cigarette in one hand, joystick in the other, with a large lipped youth suctioned onto her face. <laughs> Come here, darling. Come away from that woman. Come I'm here, I'll <laughs> Nice cup of tea. Now, where would one find the tea bags? We don't have tea bags. We haven't have tea. Oh, there. Come over here, sweetie. I want to talk to you. Come up. Something has been stolen from my room. What? Just a little certain something precious to me, darling. Have you seen this part? Where? What? Oh. <laughs> it's a sort of space age teapot, isn't it, dear? A teapot to boldly go where no teapot has been before, to seek out new life forms. I hid your stash. <gasps> where? Down the toilet. <gasps> like one used to put the tea into the pot, with, dear. A teaspoon, a bloody buggery teaspoon. <laughs> oh, a bloody buggery teaspoon. <laughs> that sounds rather clever. And what did one fill the kettle from? The bloody marvellous tap, I suppose. <laughs> In 1993, I was first asked to play that marvellous Agatha Christie creation, Miss Marple, in a Radio 4 adaptation of Murder at the Vicarage. I decided to base my Miss Marple on one of her characteristic phrases. I hope I'm not intruding, which of course she always is. I hope I'm not intruding, but the door was open oh. and in the circumstances... Yes, do come in, Miss Marple. Oh, oh thank you. Do take a seat. Oh, thank you. Oh, poor Colonel Prothero. Not a very pleasant man, perhaps, but nonetheless it is a terrible thing to happen. And actually shot in your study, I understand. That is the case, yes. Hmm. I suppose everyone has their idea of who it is that has committed the crime, and each suspects that it's somebody different. I, for instance, am quite convinced I know who did it, but I must admit I haven't a shadow of proof. One must, I know, be very careful of what one says at a time like this. Criminal libel, don't they call it? Mm. I had made up my mind to be most careful with Inspector Slack. He sent word that he would come and see me this morning. But now he has just phoned up to say it won't be necessary after all. I suppose he thinks there would be no point after the arrest. The arrest? I didn't know that there had been an arrest. Oh, yes. Now, hadn't you heard? The police have arrested Lawrence Redding. Lawrence Redding? Now, I should not have thought. You know, it isn't every day one gets the chance to play Edward Woodward's wife, and in common as muck, I very nearly did. Well, let me clarify that. I would have been his wife if I hadn't inconveniently passed away the night before the wedding. 
Some writers are such spoil sports. But it was nice to do a bit of proper acting for a change. The talented young man in this scene is Anthony Barclay. I like you. <laughs> Here, have these cufflinks. They're good ones. Oh, cheers. Uh, no need to check them here, eh? Irene, you did... You did, didn't you? I thought they might suit Neville. But you're a good lad, you have them. <sighs> Bloody hell, Irene, what if you get caught? Well, that's the excitement. Heart in your mouth, your hands shaking. You should try it sometime. I could never persuade Neville. <laughs> something old, something new. And that's the borrowed bit. Only it's for you. <laughs> oh. oh, Irene. Irene, what's wrong? Oh God, what's the matter? In there, brown bottle. <sighs> that one. Oh, what's happening? I'll be all right. Dear God. Shall I get a doctor? No, I'm all right now, really. Come on. I'm going to take you to the hospital, get you checked out. We'll call Nev once we get there. No, don't. Don't call him. Don't do anything. What? He, he doesn't know? <laughs> I am poorly soon ill, but the doctor takes care of it. I'm not worrying, Nev. I don't want to. That's why I haven't told him. Yeah, but he'd want to know. I've nursed two husbands, Sunil. I've seen them grow old and frail, and I've seen them die. It's not something I want Neville to go through with me. You've got to promise me. This is why never to twist your arm to get married, isn't it? Why you didn't want any fuss? I look at Sunil. I don't want him and me to have this burden, do you understand? Everything's perfect with us now, and I don't want it to change. Everything's wonderful. Everything's blissful. Can't you see that? This is our moment, Sunil. I won't ruin it. Here we are, where we always knew we should be. Where we always knew it would be fine Here we are Where we know we always will be In a long, long time you'll still be mine Well, it's traditional to have some playoff music and another moment from Love From Judy brings us full circle. Anyway, my tape, I can do what I like, so there. You know, we still didn't mention Arthur Askey, Bernard Braden, Tommy Cooper, Morgan Wise, Ted Ray, Benny Hill, Peter Sellers, Julian Clay. Not a power on earth can steal this, for I know we'll always feel this way. Beeb. This week was June Whitfield. The programme was compiled by Tony Hare and produced by Phil Bowker and Steve Doherty. A two-hour cassette, June Whitfield at the Beeb, is available as part of the BBC Radio Collection. Next week, it's the turn of Ronnie Barker.